Fantastic. Hello. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And before I start, I quickly want to say a quick thank you to one of our sponsors in particular, uh, Sunderland Software Center, for connecting me with Thinking Digital and giving me this chance to talk to you uh, this morning. They're a, a tech hub. One of the things they do is host and support tech companies. And one of the ways they do that is by connecting them to, to IBM, to IBM Technologies, to IBM Technical Experts, getting us to come up to Sunderland and to work with them and to show them what we're working on. So thank you to them for that. But what I want to talk about today is how we use computers. I want to talk about how we interact with computers. I remember watching Star Trek when I was a kid, because Captain Kirk had a computer, and he could use it by asking questions. He didn't have to use structured queries. He didn't have to learn a complex programming language. He just asked his questions in English, like, why is this happening? What will happen if we do that? And the computer would get him his answer. Nearly 50 years ago, it was a really clear vision of what the future of human-computer interaction could be like. And I was inspired. Fast forward to my kids watching TV, and one of the shows they used to watch is this one. Sarah Jane Adventures. It's a spin-off show from Doctor Who. And in it, they have a computer, and they use it by asking questions in English. So this vision hasn't gone away. But it's not here today. You know, this isn't how we use computers today. There's a lot of reasons why. But one of the biggest reasons is that it's really hard to get a computer to understand the English language. Uh, and I want to show you what I mean by that with a couple of examples. Have a read of this sentence. Try and imagine what you think it means. Try and picture in your mind the image that this sentence is describing. The point is there's no one right answer. There's lots of things it can possibly mean. Lots of possible interpretations of this sentence. Did I mean fly as a verb or as a noun? Did I mean bow or bow? And if I mean bow, did I mean a ribbon and bow? Or a bow and arrow? Or a, a violin bow? You know, when we read English, we have to choose between the different possible interpretations of the sentence. Using our knowledge, our knowledge of the context that the sentence is in, our knowledge of the things mentioned in the sentence. <laughs> Let me try another one on you. What do you think this means? Police. <laughs> now you're just cheating. OK, so you can see where I'm going with this. What I was hoping you would think this means is that there was a dog bite victim, and the police helped him. Police helps dog bite victim. <laughs> but what you assumed I meant was this. And if all you're doing is, is parsing the English language, recognizing the verbs and the nouns and so on, this is a valid interpretation. Because this isn't all we do. We have to apply those words in the context of the sentence. We have to use our existing knowledge. You know, we know that the police help people. We know that it would be unusual for a policeman to bite someone. <laughs> if all we had to do was, you know, to get a computer to understand English, if all we had to do was build a dictionary list of words and a list of grammar rules, we'd have finished this by now. But there's a lot more to it than that. And this problem, you know, not being able to recognize the English language, not being able to recognize the context that a sentence is in, not being able to understand what a, what a sentence actually means, it has an effect on our ability to find answers. Let me show you what I mean with an example. Uh, before I came up here to Gateshead, I tried to think of a question that we could look through. Uh, I thought we should have something a bit local. I'd be rubbish at running a pub quiz, but hopefully you can see what I'm going for here. <coughs> According to the song covered by ex-midfielder Paul Gascoigne, what is the traditional weather along the river by Gateshead. Does anyone want to help me out by shouting at the answer? Fog. Fog, fantastic, thank you. Yes, because of course the song Fog and the Tyne, the river's called the Tyne, so the answer I'm looking for, the weather, is fog. So I took this question and I put it into a search engine. <laughs> and what I got was not an answer, but a list of documents. What I got are tens of thousands of web pages and articles that mention some of the words in my question. So I mentioned the ex-midfielder, so I got a page about an ex-bookie and a page about an ex-husband. I talked about him covering a song. So I got a page about Dolly Parton being covered in tattoos and a page about someone being covered in bacon and eggs. And I, I don't know what that... I didn't dare click on that. I'd explicitly asked about the ex-midfielder, Paul Gascoigne, but I got pages about other midfielders, like Australia's newest wonder kid, Tom Rogic. So I tried another search engine, took my question again and put it into another search engine, and again I got not an answer, but a long list of documents for me to review. 
Because what it's doing is it's giving me a list of documents that contain the words from my question. Because the theory is, the answer is probably going to be in a document that contains a lot of words from my question. But it's doing that without a deep understanding of my question, and it's doing it without a deep understanding of the documents that it's returning. So without recognizing that I use the word according to talk about the link between the river and the song, it's giving me documents just because they have the word according in there. And it's up to me to read through all of these and to understand them and to decide whether or not they're relevant, and if they are relevant, to, to use that to pick out an answer. There are, there are other ways of doing question answering. There are more structured ways. We can, you know, there are approaches that translate... Uh, I've gone through my slides too fast. There are approaches that try to translate a question into a lookup <coughs> query or an equation. Um, but these suffer from the same problem. You know, without an understanding of my question, my iPad thought that I well, it handled it as if I was asking it to play the song. And I really wasn't. <laughs> so, like I say, um, this idea has been around for a long time. This idea that in the future we'll be able to interact with computers using questions. Um, and it's an idea that we, like many others, have been researching for a long time. And Watson is the name that we've given to our latest attempt to do this. Our latest attempt to build a computer system that can answer questions. So I put my question into Google, uh, sorry, into Watson, uh, before I came up here to Gateshead. And what I got was an answer, and Watson's level of confidence that this answer was correct. Actually, I was kind of hoping the confidence would have been a bit higher than this, but never mind. Um, everyone's allowed an off day. But the point is, the method of interaction was different. The important point is, this method of interaction was totally different. Watson understood what I was asking for and gave me an answer to my question. It knew I was asking for a type of weather. You know, it was able to use an understanding of the documents in its corpus. Uh, identify which ones were relevant, and use that to get me an answer to my question. Watson became famous, in, in the United States at least, uh, because we entered it into a, a TV quiz show in the US called Jeopardy. Um, Jeopardy is famous uh, for asking very difficult questions, for its complex use of language uh, with varied grammatical forms. You know, they'll ask cryptic questions like crossword clues, um, and we entered Watson to see if we could build a computer system that could answer difficult questions as well as a person could. We built it a buzzer so that it could buzz in when it had confidence in its answer. We gave it a voice so that it could read its answers out. For those of you who haven't seen how it got on, uh, let me show you a short clip. Don't worry about it, all the way down at 2,000 bucks. It's just acne. You don't have this skin infection, also known as Hansen's disease. Watson. What is leprosy? You are right. That you brute for 1600. Music fans wax rhapsodic about this Hungarian's transcendental etudes. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. <laughs> the whole match. <laughs> The whole match was played out across three nights. Um, I don't have time to show you all three shows. Um, if you're interested, they are all available online. So uh, you know, I would recommend having a look, because it's amazing to watch. Um, but spoiler alert, Watson won. Um, <laughs> in fact, it ended up with a higher score than the two human players combined. And these were the greatest players to have ever played this game. They were the grandmasters at this game. It was a great demo of the breakthroughs that we've made in machine learning and natural language processing, but that wasn't the end game. You know, that's not the objective, to, to have a computer system that can win quiz shows. There are a lot of domains where there is information locked up in complex English text, uh, information that people have to use to make important and difficult decisions. Think about healthcare. Think about medicine. There are thousands of medical papers uh, being published every single day. Thousands of long, complex, technical, scientific papers every single day. And not just across all of medicine. Uh, in any one specialist field, you can find thousands of papers being published. Uh, consider an oncologist, uh, a cancer specialist, treating breast cancer. 20 years ago, they might have been able to refer to their definitive textbook and choose from the, the three or four therapies available. Today, there's a mountain of information. Thousands of books, articles, papers, journals available online, and maybe eight or nine hundred therapies or clinical trials to choose from for treatment. So the way that doctors use computers needs to change. Uh, so I want to show you what we're doing with oncologists using Watson. This is our patient, Mrs. Yamato. She's never smoked, 
but she had a persistent cough and difficulty breathing. So she went to see her GP. The GP sent her for an X-ray, uh, which showed some lumps on her lungs. Uh, and those lumps were biopsied, and the results suggested that it's cancer. So she was referred to an oncologist, a cancer specialist specializing in heart and lung cancers. Now, the first thing they need to do is to read the patient's medical record. Uh, they have to review the patient's medical record, because this patient that they've never met before, that's just been referred to them, might come with 200 pages or more detailing their medical history. Now, Watson can help with this. Watson can read through this entire medical record and extract an understanding of it in the context of the knowledge it has from the medical sources it's previously read. Having done this, the first thing it can do is to produce a summary uh, of what it's found, an overview. This isn't about replacing the doctor. It's not about removing their need to review the patient's medical record. Next to everything that Watson's found, it's put that EMR button, electronic medical record. And pressing that takes you to where Watson found that information in the context of the medical record. Think of Watson here as acting as a signpost, highlighting the bits that look like they're important, making sure that these important bits of information are definitely brought to the oncologist's attention. And it's not just about Watson answering questions either. In this interaction model of a, of a computer as an assistant, Watson needs to be able to suggest questions as well. So this system, Watson has been trained by reading and understanding the contents of medical textbooks, journals, research papers, and treatment guidelines. And from the knowledge that's extracted from there, it knows that whether or not a patient has coughed up blood, uh, hemoptysis in the jargon, is a key diagnostic indicator. But having read this patient's medical record, it couldn't find a clear indication one way or another of whether or not this patient has coughed up blood. So it's suggesting that as a question, because it knows that the answer to that, one way or another, will improve its confidence in its understanding of this case. That's the case information tab. Let's go on to test options. And here, Watson is suggesting the tests that look like they're appropriate for this patient. Now, when Watson was playing in a game show, it could just give its answers, take it or leave it. But here, Watson is acting as an assistant to a human subject matter expert. So it needs to be able to show it's working. So next to everything that Watson says, it puts this evidence button. I mean, that was true on the case information tab as well. It's particularly true here. So if I take that top test, molecular pathology panel, if I press the evidence button next to that, Watson brings up a plain English description of its rationale for recommending this test. But more than that, I get this scrolling list on the right of the supporting evidence it considered that led it to, have, uh, led it to make this recommendation. So I've got here some treatment guidelines, some best practice from a cancer center we're working with, a recent journal article, and many more. And if I press the view button next to any of these, Watson brings up the original source material and highlights the passage that it found that it thought was relevant. Like I say, it's not about trying to build a computer doctor. It's not about trying to replace doctors in the same way that the Star Trek computer never replaced Captain Kirk. Think of it here as an assistant trying to assist a human subject matter expert who has to make a really critical, important decision based on massive amounts of information. Watson here is acting as a librarian, a librarian who has read everything that's been published in your area of expertise, and with a deep understanding of your question and a deep understanding of the available relevant literature is going to bring the right information to your fingertips to help you make your decision. Finally, the treatment options tab. Watson is suggesting the, the treatments uh, that look like they're appropriate for this patient. But with these levels of confidence, Watson is saying that we have insufficient information at this point to make a decision. We haven't run the tests, we haven't asked questions, we haven't gathered more information. All of this can be in the first few minutes after the, patient, after the oncologist gets the medical record, uh, helping them to be that much better prepared for their first consultation. But let's skip forward a bit. Let's imagine that they've had that first consultation, they've talked through some of the options, ordered a couple of those tests that Watson recommended, and now we're a couple of weeks later. The results from those tests are in, and the patient is back to see the oncologist to discuss the results. Again, Watson can help the oncologist to prepare for this consultation. Watson's review of the medical record in the context of its ongoing earlier conversation with the oncologist shows that there's two new bits of information, important bits of information that need to be brought to the oncologist's attention. So if I tap on that number two to bring up the case information tab, I see the two new results from the two new tests that were ordered. And that molecular pathology panel test that I mentioned earlier has revealed a mutation in the patient's EGFR gene, the epidermal growth factor receptor gene. And if I look at the treatment options, this has totally changed the treatment options. Watson, uh, this has changed Watson's confidence uh, in the treatments that it's recommending for this patient. But like I say, it's not about just giving a definitive 
telling them what treatment to uh, provide. If I press on the evidence button, <coughs> if I press the evidence button, what I get is a plain English description of why Watson thought this was an appropriate treatment and the evidence, uh, the supporting evidence that Watson considered ready for the oncologist review. I want to step back for a moment and explain what just happened there because we make these interfaces for use by experts uh, and they can be a bit information dense if you're not familiar with the domain. A starting point for a lot of this are the treatment guidelines. An oncologist in the US can go to the National Cancer Network uh, and get the nationally recognized, nationally approved guidelines uh, for treatment. Uh, and we've got equivalent things in this country. So we go to the guidelines and they say that if you have a non-small cell lung cancer uh, and if it's a tumor with an EGFR mutation, then you should consider a therapy called allotinib. <coughs> allotinib. I'm almost certainly mispronouncing that. But the point is, you know, this is the recommended treatment. This is what most doctors would do. And if I go back to what Watson was showing, you can see it is a treatment that Watson knows about. And it was in that first uh, set of treatment uh, options back when they all had roughly the same amount of confidence. But Watson's review of the available literature led it to have a very low level of confidence that this is going to be effective for this patient. Because it turns out there was a paper published in 2008. Uh, lung cancer with EGFR exon 20 mutations is associated with poor gefitinib treatment response, which is a mouthful. And in that paper, it says that of all of the possible mutations in the EGFR gene, there is one that does not respond to this therapy, just one. I was lucky enough to listen to a talk by one of the physicians in chief uh, of one of the cancer hospitals that is working with us to train Watson. Uh, and in that talk, he said that there are maybe only two or three doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering that would have known about this. Memorial Sloan Kettering is one of the world's leading cancer centers. Now, the point is, most doctors would have just followed the treatment guidelines. If I go back to what Watson was showing just quickly, look at that second reference in that list. Lung cancer with EGFR uh, exon 20 mutations from 2008. That's the paper brought to the oncologist's fingertips for them to review. Look at the summary. Watson is saying that from its understanding of the molecular pathology panel test results, it's recognized that this tumor has a particular mutation that's going to make it resistant to treatment with allotinib. So it's recommending this three-drug chemo combo instead. EGFR is one gene out of 340 known to have an impact on the progression or treatment of cancers. There's going to be papers and studies about each of these. And each of these can have different types of mutations. And there's going to be studies and journals and research about each of the possible mutations. And these mutations can interact, which has a massive impact. So there's going to be research and studies uh, and trials about the different interactions. And I'm just talking about you know, the uh, genomic factors here, which are by no means the only factors that a doctor needs to consider. Hundreds of pages in a medical record detailing this specific patient's uh, medical condition and history. Thousands of relevant papers, articles, books, and journals detailing the current medical understanding about each of the aspects of this patient's condition. A huge amount of information. Search terms for medical literature have to rely on the doctor being able to distill the patient's case into a few keywords. And I showed you with the Paul Gascoigne example earlier what happens if you put too many words into a search query. You end up with a lot of irrelevant results because there are so many documents that are going to match at least some of your keywords. Watson is helping. Watson can extract knowledge from complex text, and it can be taught how to reason over that knowledge, to identify answers to complex questions. And we're working with partners like cancer hospitals such as Memorial Sloan Kettering, helping us to train Watson to be able to do that. I think this kind of technology is going to change the way we do healthcare. I started by talking about Star Trek. I started by talking about this vision that inspired me as a kid, that in the future we're going to interact with computers by asking it questions. Now, we're not there today. We're not there yet, and we've still got a long way to go. But we've taken another step closer. We're a, close, uh, we're a step further towards changing how we use and interact with computers. Thank you for listening. <laughs>